Welcome to Python Basics, Numbers and Math. Computers use numbers to represent all kinds of information, from text, images, music, and even videos like the one you're currently watching. Pretty much everything is a number from the computer's perspective. For this reason, numbers and the ability to handle them play an important role in every programming language, including Python. Perhaps that's also why some beginners believe they need strong mathematical skills to become programmers. However, that's a common misconception. In reality, your elementary school knowledge of math should be more than enough to start coding. The actual level of mathematical familiarity will depend on your specific role and the application you're building. For example, you're less likely to need to know about linear algebra or statistics as a web developer than as a data scientist. In this course, you'll get an overview of the numeric types in Python, create integers, floats, and complex numbers, perform arithmetic operations, learn about the floating point representation error, work with math functions and number methods, format and display numbers as strings. During this course, you'll be using IDLE, or the Integrated Development and Learning Environment, which comes with most Python distributions out of the box. If you need a quick refresher on using IDLE, then check out one of the earlier video courses in the Python Basics series entitled Setting Up Python. Alternatively, if you want to take a deeper dive, then you may watch this Starting with Python IDLE video course. This video course is broken up into a few short lessons which you should watch in sequence to get the most out of them. You can pause the video here and take a minute to get familiar with a table of contents. Without further ado, it's time for you to get started by having an overview of the numeric types available in Python. In this lesson, you'll get a bird's eye view of the available numeric types in Python. Python has three numeric types built into its syntax, which means that you can start using them right away when you run idle. The three numeric types native to Python are integers or whole numbers, such as minus three, zero, or 42. Python calls them int for short. Then there are floating point numbers, which might have a fractional part, such as minus 2.72 or 3.14, for example. These are known as floats, and you'll learn why they're called like that. Finally, there are complex numbers composed of the real and imaginary parts. These are slightly more advanced and rarely used in practice, so you'll cover complex numbers in a later lesson. The corresponding data type in Python is called complex. It's worth mentioning that all three numeric types built into Python are signed, which means they can store both positive or negative values along with a neutral zero. Additionally, integers don't have a maximum or minimum value, which is only limited by the available memory on your computer. In contrast, floating point numbers and their complex number cousins do have a fixed range of values as well as precision. Nevertheless, they are big enough to accommodate most real-life use cases. Strictly speaking, Python has yet another numeric type which is a special kind of the integer data type. It's called boolean, or bool for short, and can only store one of two values, true or false. These values can be represented as 1 and 0 respectively. However, you shouldn't really think of booleans as numbers because they're used for a different purpose, which you'll learn about in a separate video course about conditional logic. In most applications, you'll use integers and floating point numbers almost exclusively because they cover the widest range of problems while being the most efficient. One notable exception, though, are financial operations on fractional values, which require exact precision, especially when you work with big and small quantities at the same time. Since floating point numbers have a limited precision, using them to represent currency amounts would inevitably lead to significant rounding errors. You should never use floats to represent financial data in real-world applications unless you don't mind losing information about your customer's money. A common pattern for representing amounts of money is storing them as integers in terms of the smallest currency unit, such as cents, and then converting them back to dollars. However, that approach won't work across multiple currencies, which might use different units. For example, one US dollar has exactly 100 cents, while one Bitcoin can be subdivided into almost any fraction. To address the problem with floats, Python provides a few additional numeric types through the standard library modules, which you'll learn about at another time. <laughs> 
You won't need those extra numeric types during this course, but it's worth knowing about them. The first one is called decimal because it internally stores numbers using the decimal positional system instead of the binary one like most other numeric types. Aside from that, it behaves mostly like a floating point number. Unlike a floating point number, however, it has an arbitrary yet finite precision which defaults to 28 decimal places. So you must decide up front how many digits you'd like to keep. Also, while a decimal number works with integers, you can't mix it with floating point numbers easily. If that's a requirement, then you can use another numeric type that comes with Python called fraction. It represents a rational number, or a quotient, of two integers, like one third. Fractions have infinite precision, which lets you represent numbers exactly, even if they have a recurring decimal or binary expansion without any loss of information due to rounding. If you'd like to learn more about decimal numbers and fractions, then you can check out real Python tutorials on how to round numbers in Python and representing rational numbers with Python fractions. Now that you have a general idea about the numeric types in Python, it's time to take a closer look at integers. In this lesson, you'll take a deep dive into one of the most common numeric types in programming, the integer data type, which Python calls int. If you'd like to follow along in an interactive Python interpreter session, then go ahead and start idle now. An integer is a whole number with no decimal places. The quickest way to create an integer in Python is by writing an integer literal, consisting of digits that appear literally in your code. For example, typing 42 in idle creates an integer. You can check the type of such a literal, which Python refers to as int. Because integers are whole numbers, they don't come with a fractional part. So as soon as you include the decimal point in your literal, you no longer create an integer. Even if the fractional part of your literal is equal to zero, like in the example, the result will be a floating point number, which you'll learn about in the next lesson. On the other hand, an integer literal can include the minus sign. This creates a negative integer number. Additionally, you can delimit groups of multiple digits by placing a single underscore character anywhere in your literal to make a big number easier to read. It makes no difference to Python whether you use the underscores or not, but writing a number with them is arguably more readable for humans. So far, you've only seen decimal literals consisting of the familiar 10 digits, 0 through 9. However, occasionally you might want to express a number using a different numeral system. Because computers use binary and sometimes a few other numeral systems, Python lets you create integers using those alternatives. By prefixing your integer literal with one of the few supported system bases, you can change how many digits you want to use. For example, the number 42 can be expressed as 101010 in the binary system. To tell Python to interpret such a literal as binary digits or bits, you can use the 0b prefix. Notice how idle presents the number to you in the decimal system again. It's the same number, only represented in two different ways. Similarly, you can express the number 42 in the hexadecimal system using the 0x prefix followed by digits 2 and a. You have up to 16 digits at your disposal in the hexadecimal system, the usual 10 digits from 0 to 9, plus six Latin letters A to F. The letters can be either uppercase or lowercase. The last numeral system supported by Python literals is the octal one, which has eight digits from zero to seven. You can enable an octal literal with a zero O prefix. Again, you get a decimal representation of the created integer. It's fair to say that you will rarely need to use integer literals other than the default decimal one. Nevertheless, they can sometimes be useful. Using integer literals is best when you know your numbers up front and want to embed them in your code in a literal form. However, numbers often come as strings from the users who type them on their keyboard. From an earlier video course, you might remember that you can convert a string to an integer by calling the built-in int function in Python. Notice the quotes around 42, which define a string literal. What you get back is the corresponding integer value denoted without the quotes.
Again, you can verify the type of the return value, which happens to be int. By default, the int function assumes that you will supply a string consisting of decimal digits, 0 to 9. If you'd like to choose a different base for the numeral system, then you can optionally pass a second argument to the function after a comma. In this case, you're creating an integer number 42 from a string of binary digits 101010. The maximum value for the base supported by Python is 36. It's worth noting that int accepts a value of any data type, not just strings. For example, you can pass a floating point number in order to truncate its fractional part. As you can see, the int function allows for converting values from other data types to integers, which you might need to perform some calculations on numbers rather than strings. When you call int without passing any value as an argument, it will always return zero as the result. The third way to create integers in Python is through expressions, such as arithmetic expressions or function calls. You'll learn more about those in the future. In the meantime, integer literals should be completely sufficient. All right, now you know how to create whole numbers in Python using integer literals, which you can represent with different numeral systems, including the decimal, binary, hexadecimal, and octal systems. In this case, they are all different representations of the same value. You also know about the int function, which returns zero when you call it without any arguments. Otherwise, it will convert whatever data type you supply, such as a string literal, to a corresponding integer number. When you call the int function with a floating point number as an argument, it will truncate its fractional part and return only the whole part as an integer. Finally, the int function can optionally take another argument, which is the base of the system used to interpret a string of digits, such as 101010 in the given base. Next up, you will explore floating point numbers, the second most important kind of numbers in Python. In this lesson, you'll learn how to represent numbers using Python's floating point data type, which is most suitable for numbers with a fractional part. As with integers, you can create floating point numbers using their literal form. The only difference between an integer literal and a floating point one is that a floating point literal must have a decimal point to separate the whole part from the fractional part. You don't even need the trailing zero to define a floating point number as long as you include the decimal point in your literal. Similarly, you can skip the leading zero if your number is a fraction, like point 42. Floating point numbers in Python support the same grouping of digits as integers with the help of the underscore character. As you can see, it's possible to express the same value, such as 42, using different data types in Python. The difference is how they represent it in your computer's memory and how much space they take, which in turn affects the performance and precision of various operations. In addition to this, you can define floating point literals in Python using the scientific notation, which is sometimes known as the exponential notation or the E notation. The idea behind it is to collapse the repeated zeros in a really big or a really small number and only focus on its significant digits. For example, you can write the same number as 4.2 times 10 to the power of 7. The letter E, which can be either lowercase or uppercase, stands for the exponent. The exponent itself must be an integer, but may be negative, just as the number in front of it. Such a notation may appear strange or inconvenient, but it can sometimes make handling big or small numbers easier in arithmetic operations. You might have seen the E notation on handheld calculators, which use it to represent numbers that wouldn't be able to fit on the screen otherwise. If you don't like this notation, then you can format your floating point number using a fixed number of decimal places, such as 8, to reveal all zeros. Like with integers, you can create floating point numbers in two ways. You can either use their literals consisting of digits and the decimal point, or you can call the built-in float function. When you call the function without any arguments, it returns a floating point number equal to zero. Note that this is different from an integer zero, 
However, in most cases, the function will accept a single argument, which can be either a string or a number, such as an integer or another float. That's convenient for converting other data types to floating point numbers. You'll also want to use the float function to define a few special values which don't have literal representations in the floating point number data type. In those cases, you'll pass a particular string value as an argument to the float function. Two of them are positive and negative infinity. These are useful as unbounded upper and lower bounds when you search for a maximum or minimum value, for example. Conveniently, you can compare infinity to regular numbers, which gives sensible results. The third special value in the floating point data type is called not a number. You can use it to explicitly indicate a missing value. However, it's more commonly used by Python itself to signal an undefined mathematical operation, such as dividing infinity by another infinity. There's one interesting quirk about not a number. Because Python follows the IEEE 754 specification for the floating point arithmetic, a not a number is never equal to any value, not even itself. Another thing that's different about floating point numbers when you compare them to integers is that they have a fixed limit. If you try defining a value bigger than the allowed maximum value, then you'll end up with infinity. How do you know what's the maximum value? Well, in practice, it doesn't really matter because the range of floating point numbers is so enormous that it will be more than enough in most cases. Though, if you really want to find out, then you can use the following instruction. In this case, the maximum value is about 1.8 times 10 to the power of 308. Just remember that this number isn't set in stone because various Python interpreters can have different limits depending on the platform they were built for. To sum up, you can create floating point numbers in Python using their literals that must contain the decimal point. At the same time, you don't need the trailing or leading zeros in those literals, leaving only the decimal point in place. You can specify floating point literals using the scientific notation, known as the E notation, which lets you express really big or really small floating point numbers in a concise way. The second way of defining floating point numbers in Python takes advantage of the built-in float function. When you call the function with no arguments, it'll return a floating point number equal to zero. However, you're almost always going to call it with one argument to convert another data type into a floating point number. Specifically, you can convert a string composed of decimal digits and a few special characters such as the minus sign, or you can convert an integer or even another floating point number. There are also a few special floating point values that you can obtain with the help of the float function. They are the negative infinity, positive infinity, and not a number. Okay, now that you know about integers and floating point numbers, it's time to learn how you can use them in arithmetic expressions in Python.